<laughs> and they got cookies for him out there. Water and Sewer Advisory Committee for the City of Jacksonville is coming to order. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and any citizens that are watching on G10. I'm going to call a meeting to order. First is adoption of the agenda for this meeting of March 12, 2015. You all have read this, I take it? I make a motion to adopt the agenda. We have a motion, we have a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, raise their right. And there we go. Okay. Approval of the minutes of the February 12th, 2015 meeting. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion on it, any corrections? Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. All in favor, signify by raising your right hand. <laughs> Approved. Annual drinking water quality report. Wally Hanson. That's you. <laughs> That's you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board. Um, in the next couple of weeks, you will be, um, actually with your water utility bill, You'll be receiving a copy of the annual drinking water quality report. Um, it's also known as the Consumer Confidence Report, or CCR. Um, we've been distributing the annual report since 1999. Um, it, is, it has required portions um, from EPA. Um, those are lead in its effects. Um, our drinking water sources are where the city gets our drinking water from. Um, the susceptibility to contamination. Um, it provides a contact information for customers to contact the city of Jacksonville. Mr. Cram over here, and it gives a, a number that you can contact. Um, it also gives a list of analyses that are conducted and the results from those. Um, and those include to total coliform, lead and copper, um, synthetic organic compounds, volatile organic compounds, nitrates, and inorganics. Um, that's pretty standard. It looks the same each year. Um, one thing that you'll notice different this year from the past years is you will see a notice regarding fluoride. Um, fluoride is naturally occurring in, or it naturally occurs in our, um, the aquifers that we pull from. The city does not feed or inject chloride into our system, um, and we don't use it in our treatment process. Um, the city is required every three years to test each of the entry port points into the city system. Um, there are two levels for fluoride testing. One is the maximum level, which is 4.0, and there's also a secondary maximum level of 2.0, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, the, where we test or actually where we, the places that we um, test for fluoride as it comes into our system are Gum Branch Central, which is the, the top circle um, up right under the word fluoride. And then to the left is well six, or sorry, well seven, and then well six right below it. And then 258 is right in this area. And then the, right here in the center of town is the nano plant or the the water treatment plant and you can see that the white area on the screen is the city limits and then that blue area just outside the white area kind of along here is the etj and then the green is obviously in the county so what you're going to see um in the the annual drinking water report is that in 2014 we had to test for fluoride we tested the five locations. Four of the lo those locations were um, well under the, the 2.0 secondary requirement. However, we had one, 258, which I circled a moment ago, that was at 2.1, which is just over the secondary um, maximum contamination level. And basically what that says is it, it's not a violation um, of drinking water standards but it triggers a cautionary alert regarding dental fluorosis. Um, dental fluorosis is um, 
occurs in young children and it's basically the yellowing of their permanent teeth. And it's, it, what they found is over long periods of time with repeated um, exposure, there is the possibility at over 2.0 for dental fluorosis to occur. Um, however, with the city system, we have multiple sources of drinking water. Um, there's an extraordinarily small chance that that could happen. And I'll talk about why that is. Um, in 2014, 258, the site that um, we were just over 2.0, provided about 3% of our total drinking water for the system. So, um, you know, we have the, the Black Creek Aquifer and the Castle Hain, and the water treatment plant is, the Castle Hain Aquifer supplies the water treatment plant. That's about between two-thirds and three-quarters of our drinking water. The Black Creek Aquifer, which is where the 258 site is located, um, supplies, a, you know, between a quarter and a third of our drinking water, but there's multiple sites. There's 258, there's Gum Branch Central, and then there's Wells 6 and 7. So, as you can tell, and as this water gets blended, it comes down significantly. And to that point, um, the city took 600 distribution samples in 2014. Fluoride is one of the many things that we test for. Um, and of the 600, we had two sample locations mm -hmm. that exceeded, and they just slightly exceeded the 2.0 um, thing, and the, sorry, the 2.0 limit. However, those, the locations are tested a total of four times a year, and the other three times during the year that those sites were tested, they were actually under the 2.0. So, you know, the important thing is here that we're required to send out a notice. You're going to see that in your, um, in your annual report. However, in our, because we hit that trigger, we have to send them a notice. There's nothing, you know, we can't prevent that. It's actually required. But the important thing is the way that the city blends our water and the location, <coughs> there is no health risk associated with any of the city's drinking water. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, you as the board, in case somebody has questions about that notice that comes out um, in, in council, that there is no concerns with the city's drinking water. Yes, sir. Real quick question. You kept saying the secondary for the 2.0. What's the primary? The primary is 4.0. So we're way below way, that. Yes, sir. But 2.0 triggers the notice. 2.0 triggers the, the notice. Dental. That's correct. And it's for dental fluorosis. That's what the notice is regarding. But again, the likelihood that that would even occur is minute because, again, in 2014, that was only about 3% of the total drinking water. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> you may have covered it, and I just didn't hear it, but what I'm trying to ask you is uh, throughout the city, we all get in the same quality of water. Or is one part getting a fraction more or a fraction less? Or uh, is at one point the water all comes together and then it's distributed? No, it comes in. Let me go back to my map. Let's see if I can erase this real quick so it's not confusing. Or maybe not. I'll let Alan do it. <laughs> it's magic. So the Castle Hain Wells, all of the Castle Hain Wells, all of the Castle Hain Wells come to the water treatment plant. It's treated and then it's sent out to the customers. Gum Branch Central actually comes down Gum Branch Road and is fed directly into the system. <clears throat> it's, sorry, it's Black Creek water and it doesn't, it's, it does not require any treatment. Are we completely out of Black Creek now? No, we're not. We, br we get about, um, last year I think we averaged just under 1.5 million gallons per day, um, which is, I mean, we're, we're over four, four and a half. But our quota is steadily getting uh, less and less each year? That it, well, we do, have to, um, we do have to contend with the withdrawal requirements from the Black Creek. Yeah, yeah. The next one that we face is in 2018, and we could be facing another 25% reduction 
which would take us down to a permitted level of 1 million gallons per day from the Black Creek. However, there are certain requirements that we can possibly meet where we would not have to take that reduction. So right now we're permitted for somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 million gallons a day, a day from the Black Creek Aquifer. But we're, because we're, the way we operate the water treatment plant, we're really only averaging somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 million gallons per day. And then the other source from Black Creek is well six and seven, which are right here. And they come in 258 along with two fi the 258 central. So these are fed directly into the system. This is fed directly into the system and all of the Castle Hain wells go out from here. So there, it's not like it's all brought to one place and then blended. So it is fed from multiple locations. In another way of saying 258 services, a portion of the city and not the whole city. It is possible that it could go through the system, but it be so diluted as it travels through. I think it primarily goes to the downtown tank. Yeah, it, it'll go to the, the old water plant tank and then that's first. But we have, a, we have a booster pump, so, so what happens is when, when it's coming from the 258 side, it's being pushed over to the common side, it's getting mixed, it's constantly, there's a constant turnover with it. It doesn't just sit, we can actually shove it over the common tank, which is the high side of town. They're doing that, so it's, it's getting really, really mixed. I think an interesting part of what William's uh, point is here, which is not necessarily dealing with the fluoride, is understanding how the system works because if one pump was to be contaminated with anything, how would that affect the whole system? And is if it's such that it's disassociated from being <coughs> put out to the whole system, does that mean a portion of the city is at jeopardy if a well becomes contaminated with sand? Well, and we do, we te we pull daily samples to ensure that we have we do not have any problems. And the other half of that is everybody's getting the same quality of water. That's correct. Overall, yes, how are our wells doing? Are they uh, recovering uh, as fast as, uh, as uh, you would expect them to? <clears throat> Oh, are they uh, dragging a little behind? Or what? You're, you're talking about the Black Creek Aquifer? I'm, I'm sorry? You're talking about the Black Creek Aquifer? Oh, wow. The Black Creek Aquifer, it, actually what they're finding is it's replenishing faster than what they originally anticipated. So, and some of that could be due to the withdrawal. Some of it's due to it's actually replenishing faster than what they expected. So, and that's the reason that if you meet certain criteria, that we may not have to take the next reduction. Is the Castle Hain also recovering quicker than they thought? The we see a direct correlation between the Castle Hain and the surficial aquifers. Um, what I will say is that we have um, we have a group that consists of the city, Omwasa, and the base, the three largest water providers in Onzo County, and we also invite others like Scientific Water um, to sit in. And attend those meetings and what we basically we're looking at the ground water sustainability on regional effort and two of the interesting things that we're currently working on is one a uh, monitoring well uh, network to where we would go in and install monitoring wells not only in the Black Creek but in the Castle Hain and the surficial aquifers and we would be able to see around the county what's happening to those aquifers um, and we have um, ground management associates out of Greenville which is Dr. Sproul who's probably one of the most renowned people in this you know in this region um, for groundwater um, the other exciting thing that we have is a model that we're working on that would be essentially countywide. It would be a model that works with the city, the base, and Omwasa systems and look at places for interconnect, um, not only of uh, raw water, but also distribution so that 
if we needed to transfer water or move water around and look at this as a holistic approach and more regional effort as we're moving forward. So the idea is to make it all more sustainable. Are we, uh, I know nothing is 100%, <coughs> but are we in any danger of uh, sinkholes because of flow recovery? No, sir, not that I'm aware of. Well, if you're aware of it, maybe. <laughs> Most of <coughs> most of the sinkholes or holes you see around town are either due to underground sewer pipes or <laughs> underground stormwater pipes that have separations in the joints. Sand gets in and over time develops a sinkhole or a pothole. Then getting back to that again, then how uh, <laughs> the average age of our pipes that are buried in the ground? Ooh, I don't know if I could give an average age. We have some of our system that's pretty old if you and the whole system the whole system is probably around 30 if you average it out around 30 years old or a lot or more right <coughs> out on 258 you go down past the senior center down and up there's a brick building out there what is that, is that part is of the well gun branch central okay now back on wait the down 258 <coughs> Did you say down 258? Yeah. That would be 258, right, Jeff? Oh, yeah. 258. Now, there's another one down there. It used to be a junkyard or something back in there on the on the left-hand side that the city's got. We have well six as well as where the gas station is. Yeah. Well seven is on Catherine Lake Road about a quarter mile down there. That's, that's a good size building, that one is. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, one other question. Wait a minute. What are those buildings? Well. Who else? Oh, they're well. At the end, I don't know the name of the road anymore, but it, it turns by that first, the smaller building, and you go all the way in the back. That used to be a well field back there. Is it still in use? We have wells one through five on there. It's actually yes, called Wells Road. The road is the point before in the country or whatever is back there. Yeah. We have four wells on that road. One's next to Linwood Zoo, and they go down that road. But I knew there was some back there, but I didn't know if they were still being used yeah. or not. Oh, no, no. Those are the ones that people can take. Oh. Those are Black Creek wells. Anything coming down Gum Branch, coming from Richlands is Black Creek, right? That's correct. Coming from the Richlands direction. That's Anybody all I have. Any more questions? Okay, Pete. I guess <coughs> your discussion on the land treatment. Oh, joy. <coughs> okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members. Um, if you noticed in your last month's report, we gave you the status of the lagoon levels. And we were getting dangerously close to our permitted freeboard capacity. Um, on February the 25th, we hit our permitted freeboard capacity. So uh, af after we experienced a little bit of warm up that day, we, we um, initiated our emergency spraying program um, just so we could get some relief off the lagoons. And we have been in the emergency spraying status since February 25th. Uh, of this year. Um, contributing factors were rain, the rainfall, uh, freezing temperatures. Uh, we really had a sporadic spray schedule because of the weather, weather during, the, uh, during this time. Um, I think last year total was 79 days that we could not irrigate out of the 365 days. Um, but since February 25th, we've been spraying every day three zones a day for 10 hours um, and that is expected to uh, carry out through at least the end of this month um, uh, this this chart that you see here is is the precipitation of uh, the blue bar is rain recorded at LTS and the red bar is actual rainfall recorded inside the city um, you see it's almost a uh, well it is double double the amount of rainfall inside the city versus out of the spray fields. Um, the, the next slide is a comparison of the influent. Influent is the wastewater received from the city to the headworks point at LTS. And um, the, the blue line is, is, is the line graph for the influent. The red line is the effluent. Effluent is the amount of wastewater that we treated and 
pushed out into the spray fields. Uh, as you can see, those lines are going in the wrong directions. So, uh, and that's just based on from November to February time frame, which is the period of time that got us into the condition we're in. Before we move, can sir? I add one thing to that? Yes, sir. Um, one thing that I wanted to key in on actually the last two slides is Jill has it figured out in our lagoons. We have about 50 million gallons, give or take, per foot of storage, right? Mm -hmm. So as you can see on this graph, this is total for the month. You're somewhere down in January alone, around 100 million gallons of what we sent out to the field and up over 200 million gallons of what we received. So that time, that month alone, we lost two feet in the lagoon levels just based on 50 million gallons worth of storage. Um, if you go back one slide, the other thing is if you look at this total over here, 20.66 inches of rain, 24 inches of rain will be two feet in our lagoon levels. So we're just under two feet. So those two factors alone, we lost almost four feet of storage in our lagoon levels this year. So those are some of the challenges that the LTS staff have been battling. Thank you. Um, this this chart here is just is basically just showing you the numbers. Um, you notice that in the beginning, from February 25th up until March the 6th, I was just I was rounding when I was recording. Is I just rounded the numbers for simplicity, and then this afternoon when I added this last little bit, I just added the actual numbers. So that's the that's why you see rounded numbers versus the actual numbers there, but. And then it was, it was basically, again, it's how much, how much we took in, how much we put out on a day by day. We've been tracking it day by day, and we'll continue to do so until we get uh, out of the emergency spray status. Um, this chart has the influent versus effluent since we began emergency spraying. The, the blue line is the influent. You can see on February 25th, uh, we lost a little bit of ground, but then we started to recover, recover gradually. Um, the red line is the actual effluent going out. Um, I am happy to say that when we did our rotation of zones today, we actually stopped the three zone rotation and we're going into a three zone, two zone rotation. Um, and the three zone rotation, it, over the period of time, it gave two days of recovery before we went back and sprayed on that, those three zones again. Now we'll get uh, maybe two and a half days or so as we go three zones, then go to two zones and then carry it back around. It's just the continuation of that cycle. It gives a little bit longer recovery time now because we are seeing some relief in the lagoons and the <coughs> influence from the city is gradually decreasing as well, so. What level of room is there do you have to get back to before you stop the emergency spraying? The, the stopping the emergency spraying is the sole call of the chief wastewater plant operator. Yeah. He is the one who says emergency spraying. He is the one that says we stop emergency spraying. Our comfort zone is to drop the lagoons at around two feet. Two more feet? Well, one more foot, because we've dropped them a foot. Okay. Today, South Lagoon was at 13, was 13 two, he said this morning? Mm -hmm. Something like 13 two, it was at 14 two, which was the freeboard was at 14. And then the East West, I think was, we were at 11 seven and freeboard there is 12 five. So we do want to get down about two feet below, talking with William before we, uh -huh. Stop emergency spray. Right. So, 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 did you exceed the amount that Deaners allows you to get? We have not exceeded that. We're not. Okay. We're not so, when no. you're talking about what your free board and emergency spraying is, it's different from such a say a Swine Lagoon and what they're thinking of their free board and their emergency because right. Deaner has regulations for those. Yes, we have. We have the two two foot permitted free board is our inner limit. We reached that limit. We called DWQ, advised them what was going on, advised them we're going to emergency spray, it, and they said okay um, just you know keep us in the loop and then as they do the monthly reports that'll go in when we stop emergency spraying we'll call and say okay we're comfortable now with lagoons we're going to go back to our normal rotation as weather permits meaning if we don't have the half inch of rainfall if we don't have freezing temperatures if the ground conditions based on the operators say ground conditions are good we can spray then we'll go back into our normal probably eight hour rotation. Right now we're going to, when we go to three, two, we're going to drop back to nine hours because now we're spraying 10. Now we're going to drop back to nine, gradually scale it back and then get back into our eight hour rotation. Probably at the end of this month, we'll be back to 
unless we get a lot more recovery. Um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I do want to add one thing. We, um, there, the entire time we're uh, emergency spraying, Jill and her staff are actually out taking daily creek samples. And so far, we have not noticed any increases in our creek samples, which is good news. Wally, is this a, uh, completely a function of the weather this winter, or is this uh, an ongoing problem that we've talked about before about the population and use and what is going out to the uh, LTS? I think uh, one of the largest things that we've you know we've been working toward and we've talked about is inflow and infiltration i mean we've we've got to continue to make strides in our inflow and in infiltration um <coughs> pete and i have been working on some charts um and talking back and forth and one of the things that we've noticed is there's direct correlation between precipitation and our flows going up there's also a direct correlation between groundwater levels, which we use the USGS charts. Um, I think the nearest one's in Comfort or something. But you can see in December, we had heavy rainfall, if you remember Christmas Eve. And if I remember right, the USGS um, chart had groundwater somewhere near between half a foot and a foot below surface. and we had some really high flows in December, um, above what our normal usage would be. So in, um, you know, in the summer, when the groundwater starts going deeper and falling off, and the rain, you know, it's drier, you can see our flows start to come back down. So it's, you know, it shows the importance of our inflow and infiltration <coughs> program. Taking the chance that I may be laughed at once again in this board meeting. Um, we've talked about the LTS and the fact there is no more room out there that even though you have quite a few acres, a good portion of that you're not allowed to use for spring. That's correct. So are we going to be looking at every winter at fighting a free board situation that, yes, gets corrected in the summer, but you come closer and closer to having a violation because just the weather is going to force you there plus the population pressure. And if that's the case, when do we start looking for the next LTS, which we've been told in this board can't be put in this county? Well, we're, I don't know that I can fully answer your question, but what I will say is in 2012, we had a um, group, it, it wasn't just one consultant, it was a panel that came in, evaluated where we were, and at that point, if you remember, we were facing mortality rate with some of the trees out there. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually made some recommendations that we're working on. Um, and just for example, um, one of the things that the staff out at LTS are working on is um, what we call daylighting the laterals. It's getting some of that, getting the, the vegetation that's grown in on the sprinklers because that's the way we apply the wastewater is by sprinkler and getting that vegetation cut back and then getting the canopy opened up so sunlight can get in and wind can blow through and they we've we've seen huge success in the areas that we've done that in addition um, the report also recommended um, cultivation around the spray areas and down the ladder the laterals um, basically to you know over time the ground gets compacted so basically break that up and in addition we've there was also some recommended recommendations to do what they call ripping which is where you take something and you actually try to break through the hard pan underneath so that water percolates um, so those are all things that we still have to work toward and obviously the forestry management which um, you know we've only had a, a active forestry management plan for a very short period of time and we're still trying to catch up to all of the recommendations in that forestry management plan. So those are all things that we're going to have to focus on. Um, but that only delays needing a new LTS. That's at correct. At some point of population. That's correct. When was the last time we had emergency spraying? 2010. And it was in February. February. It was right about the same time period. <coughs> 
Well, I'm just wondering if it may be prudent to consider, uh, which I would suggest the board might support, putting a plan together for a new LTS, not necessarily buying any ground or getting consultants, but just saying what would be necessary since, as I, we were briefed here, the last LTS took several years once it decided to, to go for one. So if this is something where we say what we think we have will work for three, four, five years, but it's going to take six years to put a new LTS in, maybe we need to be thinking about how we would do that and do it without the panic of being threatened with penalties for being over our free board. I, ju I just offer that as a consideration. Thank you. Any other questions? Who's doing the grease reports? Pete, are you? So the the grease report should be submitted in the report. Right, I, I, it, it's in here. I just wanted to ask a question about yeah. it. I Go don't ahead. know. It says here, yeah, let me get it now. <clears throat> But on the violations, <clears throat> 15 repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. um, what are we doing? We're finding them how much on that after the uh, first warning and all? Is, was it 25 or $50? 25 for the first and repeats are 50. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be doing any good, does it? If you got 15, it keeps doing it every month. What we found is it's not exactly the same Say 15. 15. Well, 15 were repeat offenders, so I don't. But it's not it, the 15 repeat offenders in February aren't necessarily the same 15 repeat offenders in December or January. And when you say a repeat offender, you're not talking about somebody two months in a row. You're talking about if they've ever had a previous violation or ha ever had a previous violation. It's over a period of time, time, but I think it's six months. months. Six it's months. months. If you, go, time, if you get, a, get a violation and you go six months without. Then you're and no longer considered month, you get one. one. You're, you're not considered a repeat okay. offender. You're so it's six months. Offender. I think it's six months. <laughs> okay. Where's my. How about the one that had the greaser, the three grease related spills? Yeah, where was that at? I can't say that. Well, yeah, I, I can't. Correct it. It was. <laughs> it was. It was uh, A well-known establishment. <laughs> oh, no. uh, we I, I'm not, I can't call them out on air. Um, but uh, <laughs> what we found is, um, and we helped them with this problem, is they actually had a blockage downstream of the grease trap, and they didn't realize it. So every time all their sewer was mixing in with the grease trap, so we ended up helping them because we could take it and mix. We took it and cleaned out their grease trap and you know charged them with a rate schedule uh -huh. and then help them get their blockage cleared out um, but it was until that point that they realized they had the blockage and that's why they were mixing their actual waste with their grease so we helped them with that and got them squared away is that something that's likely to reoccur there um anything's possible um, but i think now they, they've had a changeover in management so now you have some new people there who weren't necessarily aware of the, the processes and but now they are um, but I mean yeah you can get grease blockages anywhere yeah, I mean the yeah. obviously you don't like it when the grease makes it past the grease trap so was it a what they were doing you know, too hot to something that it wasn't congealing within the trap that you helped figure out so it's not uh, coming yeah. down and ending up in the lift station I think it was just high usage and then not lack of maintenance combination and then now uh, so we educated them a little bit helped them out got them back to the starting point and then so far it's progressing as it should any other questions for water, <coughs> water and sewer rate discussions <laughs> at your last meeting you requested to have at this meeting discussions whether um, the board would like to support what we'll call as needed rate increases in water and sewer rates, which is um, basically we we look at rate increases as they're required to cover our expenses, or whether we should look at incremental increases. Um, and just using, I believe it was you, Mr. Dorn, that threw out at the meeting, you know, a half a percent for per year or a percent per year. Um, so really, I'll open it up to the board 
for discussion.